Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 34 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. The hero of New Orleans, Old Hickory. Today, by listener request, we explore the life and ideas of Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States. During his lifetime, Andrew Jackson served as one of the most popular presidents. And yet today, we remember him as a controversial figure, given his views on slavery, Native Americans, and banks. Today, Mark R. Cheatham, professor of history at Cumberland University and author of Andrew Jackson, Southerner, leads us on an exploration of the life, times, and ideas of Andrew Jackson. During our exploration, Mark reveals why we need to understand Andrew Jackson as a Southerner before we can understand him as a man and president. How Jackson rose from being the son of poor backcountry settlers in the Waxhaw region of South Carolina to President of the United States. And information about the three big issues that Andrew Jackson faced as President. The nullification crisis, Indian removal, and the Second Bank of the United States. This is a great episode, and as you will see, Mark expertly helps us separate all the myths and tall tales we have heard about Andrew Jackson from the real Andrew Jackson, who was at his core a Southern gentleman. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Mark R. Cheatham is a professor of history at Cumberland University in Lebanon, Tennessee. His research interests include the Civil War, Southern history, and the history of conspiracy theories. Mark is the author of two books, Old Hickory's Nephew and, most recently, Andrew Jackson, Southerner. Mark, welcome to Ben Franklin's World. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. Today, we're going to talk about Andrew Jackson. Before we get there, I think we really need to begin with you telling us about your favorite conspiracy theory. <laughs> well, my students like to ask me that, too. Um, I, a little bit of background on the conspiracy theories course I teach, I became interested in this but partly because of my, my growing up in a fundamentalist Christian uh, family and church. And so we were exposed to conspiracy theories all the time. So when I became a college professor, I thought, you know, it would be kind of cool to use something that has always interested me and put it in an educational academic setting and figure out, you know, why do people believe the things they believe? So I, I did this course when I taught up in Manchester, New Hampshire, and I brought it with me back to Tennessee. Um, my favorite, I guess, conspiracy theory is anything about Freemasons or the one world government. And the reason is because if you think about it, if if Freemasons who've been around for several hundred years now, if they're really that good, why haven't they accomplished this great plot that they've put together? You know, they're either brilliant and they're just waiting for the exact right moment in history or they're extremely incompetent. Um, and I'm not sure which one it is, but my students always seem to find them interesting. And so that's kind of become my favorite one. Let's move into Andrew Jackson because we have a lot of ground to cover because he's such a complex individual. In the beginning of Mark's book, Andrew Jackson, Southerner, Mark states that in order to really comprehend Andrew Jackson, we must understand that he identified as a Southerner. Mark, would you describe what qualities made up Southern identity during the lifetime of Andrew Jackson, which which I think is about 1767 to 1845, right? Right. There, there are five qualities I identify in the book, and we don't have time to go over all of those, but they are um, slaveholding, obviously, is, is the one that's most prominent, I think. Uh, Jackson's belief in manifest destiny, the, the idea of westward expansion, that this is something that God has given to the American people, or at least the white Americans. Uh, the idea of honor, you know, the, the protection of public reputation among elite gentlemen of this period. Violence is certainly um, one of the core Southern qualities that Jackson adheres to. 
throughout his lifetime. And then finally, there's kinship, which is something that Jackson uses to great advantage during his lifetime. So since we're pressed for time, I'll just talk about Jackson's slaveholding. Um, Jackson acquires his first enslaved person on his way to Tennessee in the late 1780s. It's a young woman by the name of Nancy. Over the next few years, he acquires even more and more enslaved people. And by the time he becomes president, he has well over 100 uh, enslaved people at his Hermitage Plantation in Nashville and at other farms that he owns across the South. And at the height of his slaveholding, he owns close to 200 slaves. And that's what makes him prominent. That's what makes him wealthy. That's what gives him the ability to actually become president because that connects him to prominent men, and they are the ones who push him to become president. And one of the things that's ironic about Jackson, of course, is the fact that he's a slaveholder, yet he's held up as a champion of the common man. And what many Americans, you know, in years past and probably even today don't understand is that Jackson is the champion of the the common white man. He's not the champion of all Americans. Andrew Jackson seems to have lived a real rags to riches story. He grew up in the Waxhaw region of South Carolina, and then he moves to Tennessee, where he becomes a member of the gentry or elite. Mark, can you provide us with an overview of Jackson's rags to riches story and Perhaps tell us where the Waxhaw region is. Sure. I'll start with where he grew up. Uh, The Waxhaw region is on the North Carolina-South Carolina border. It's about uh, 60, 75 miles east-southeast of Charlotte, North Carolina, if you know where that's at. Um, And by the way, both states claim him as their own. Uh, Jackson believed that he was born in South Carolina. Um, but there is a little bit of dispute there. Uh, this was an area that, when Jackson was born in 1767, was considered the back country, or you might use the term frontier. But it was also the, a place that was connected to Charleston. And one of the one of the things that Andrew Jackson Southern does is it reorients the way we think about Jackson, because many people think of him as a Westerner. They think of him as almost like a John Wayne type character. But where Jackson grew up, even in the Waxhaw region, was connected to Charleston by trade routes. There were people moving back and forth, selling things. There was certainly news going back and forth. Uh, He has two uncles who are uh, fairly well off for the region who have connections in Charleston. So when you look at, at Jackson's early life, he's actually oriented toward Charleston, which is you know part of that transatlantic world that the colonies were part of. So when you think about him being oriented more toward the Atlantic seacoast and not oriented toward the West, to me that helps explain why Jackson's Southern identity is something we need to recognize and pay attention to because most of his life is spent in the Waxhaw region. He lives there until his early teens when he moves because his immediate family had died uh, either before the revolution or during the revolution. Then he moves to Charleston. He eventually moves up to Charlotte. He'll become a lawyer. And it's only when he's 21 that he actually moves to Nashville where he lives the rest of his life. Now, you know, 21 years old in the late 1700s is not the same as 21 years old today. But even in that period, when you are 21, a lot of your character, a lot of your personality is solidified. And I think if we think about that, then that makes Jackson's Southern identity more understandable than this idea that he's a Westerner, that he's a frontiersman who sort of carves his way out into the Western wilderness. You, You asked about his rags to riches story. This is another one of those interesting things about Jackson that has been played up in the historiography. Um, Jackson sort of is a rags to riches story. Uh, His immediate family is not well off. I mentioned the two uncles who are. But for him to become the wealthy planner that he does in Nashville, he has to have a lot of help. And that help comes not from his immediate family who, who had died. It really doesn't even come from his uncles. It comes from other people that he makes connections with, other men in particular he makes connections with. So just like I think pretty much any rags to riches story, Jackson doesn't become wealthy and successful because he pulls himself up by his bootstraps, but he becomes wealthy and successful partly through his own ambition, but partly because there are people there to help him become successful. That goes back to that saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Absolutely. Jackson really did form these complex and advantageous social and familial networks. Could you, I mean, was that typical? Could anybody form these networks or or did you just have to luck out kind of by birth? (laughs) Well, in Jackson's case, um, he 
is sort of lucky uh, in the beginning, and then I think he he latches on to this idea and and uses it to his advantage. If you think about these the idea of kinship, which is one of the major themes of the book, kinship is basically there are three types of kinship. You have your blood relations, you know, the people who are who who you're related to by blood genetically. You have marital kin, people uh, who either marry into your family or whose family you marry into. And then you have fictive kin. Uh, and these are people who are not related to you by blood, probably not probably not even by marriage, but these are people whom you consider family and who consider you family. And so Jackson, like I said, doesn't really have any blood relations um, that he takes advantage of uh, once he leaves the Waxhaw region. So he really relies on fictive kin, uh, particularly the men who sort of take him under their wing and help him become a lawyer, and then they get him his appointment to to what becomes Nashville. And that introduces him then to uh, his marital relations, the Donaldsons. Uh, The Donaldsons were one of the two most prominent families in Nashville when Jackson arrived. Uh, They were an old Virginia gentry family. And Jackson, when he moves to Nashville and marries Rachel Donaldson Robards, one of the daughters of John Donaldson, um, that becomes really the launching pad for him to acquire land through speculation, to bolster his legal career, to eventually enter politics. And the Donaldsons, the marital kin, and then some of the fictive kin network that he takes advantage of are the ones who push him to become president, or at least to run for president and then support him when he does become president. When many of us think of Andrew Jackson, think of the hero of New Orleans who won that battle in 1815. In fact, I learned during my recent trip to the Hermitage, that's how Jackson would have wanted us to remember him as as a general. But he actually started his career as a lawyer, not a soldier. So how did Jackson come into his military career? And was it typical for a lot of lawyers to turn professional soldiers? It wasn't unusual. Uh, In Tennessee, there was actually a state law for white men that you had to join the state militia. So Jackson is compelled to join the militia. And militia during this period were honestly not necessarily just about um, practicing the military uh, arts. Uh, in Tennessee, it was to some extent because there are lots of Native American attacks and whites find themselves defending themselves very often. But the militia were also political. And if you were someone who was an aspiring politician, if you were someone who wanted to hold local office or even to hold state office, you would use the militia to your advantage by uh, doing all the things you were required to do, the weekly or monthly or quarterly meetings, often, however often you were to meet. And what you would do is you would go and talk to, to men, you would drink with them, you would you know, tell stories and all those things. And what you were doing was you were building a network of men who hopefully liked you so that when you decided to run for political office, they would come out and vote for you. So Jackson enters the military in Tennessee largely because of politics, largely because he has men around him telling him, if you want to be successful, you need to join the militia. And then he sort of happens into the the War of 1812 and his hero status there. And he doesn't have a lot of military training um, in his background. But one of the things that Jackson is, is he's a leader. And he is, throughout the War of 1812, someone who over and over proves to his men, the men serving under him, that he will lead them into battle, he will stick with them, and he will do his best, in most cases, um, to lead them to victory. And I think that is what inspires his men. It's not his military training or his background. It's the fact that he's a leader and he's willing to be with them when they take on the enemy, whether it's Native Americans or the British. It seems like this leadership quality is something that is just imbued in his personality, because in 1788, Jackson moves to Nashville, Tennessee, and it doesn't really seem like a developed place. And yet he steps into a leadership role to develop it, which I mean, would you tell us about Nashville, Tennessee in 1788 and what Jackson did when he arrived there? He arrives in Nashville, uh, which at that point was probably less than 200 uh, white settlers, and they were really scattered in various settlements in what is now Nashville proper, 
and in surrounding areas. So it's a very, I don't know if, if New Englanders use the term backwater, but it's sort of a backwater place. It's sort of the frontier. Um, and these are these are white people who are really struggling for their existence. So it's a place that if you are ambitious, if you are someone who is uh, sensitive enough and strategic enough that that you understand could make your place in this society, um, that you could do well. And Jackson does that. And as I mentioned before, what really helps him is the fact that he strikes up this romance with Rachel Donaldson Robards, and that is the key to his entree into Nashville society, into the Nashville gentry, because that connection, that marriage, is what elevates him to prominence in Nashville and then brings him to the attention of statewide politicians, or at least at that point it was actually territorial-wide politicians, who then bring him into the state offices that he acquires before he takes part in the War of 1812. Jackson relies heavily on kinship, which seems to be part of his Southern identity. Does his Southern identity also explain his fondness for dueling? I mean, he seems to have participated in a lot of duels. So could you tell us about the tradition of dueling and about how many duels he participated in? I can do that. Um, I'll tell you that every once in a while, someone will send me a link to an internet site like BuzzFeed or or something like that. And it'll be something about Jackson. And the website will talk about Jackson fought hundreds or dozens of duels. And he was, uh, uh, you know, this, this very violent man. And to some extent, Jackson was violent, but he doesn't fight nearly as many duels as people think. If you look at the evidence, Jackson fights two and a half duels over his lifetime that we know about for sure. Um, the first duel that he fights is on his way to, to Tennessee. He stops in Jonesboro, which is in East Tennessee, and uh, he and the men in his company had to stop there because there were there were Indian attacks between Jonesboro and Nashville. So while he's in Jonesboro, Jackson practices law, and he gets into some sort of uh, debate or argument with another lawyer, and it leads to a challenge from this lawyer to go and to fight a duel. Now, dueling was something that was uh, almost exclusively for elite white men. So the fact that this other lawyer challenged Jackson to a duel says something about Jackson, even at that young age of 21. It says that this man, this other lawyer, recognized him as uh, an equal. And the fact that Jackson accepted the duel says something about Jackson's idea of himself, which is that Jackson saw himself as an equal. He saw himself as a member of that elite class. And the purpose of dueling was not necessarily to kill the other participant. Now, Jackson does kill someone in a duel, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But in in most cases, when, when men fought duels, all that they were trying to do was to protect their public reputation to protect their honor and could mean that you go out onto the dueling grounds and you fire your pistols into the air, shake hands, and you walk away. Uh, It could mean that you did fire at each other uh, and try to actually kill one another. But the purpose of the duel was really to protect your public reputation, to prove your masculinity, and to show other people that you were not afraid to lose your life in order to protect your reputation. So Jackson's first duel uh, is in 1788. His half duel that I mentioned uh, takes place in the early 1800s when he and Tennessee Governor John Sevier um, have a disagreement. Uh, Sevier thought that Jackson had uh, thrown him under the bus, so to speak, uh, regarding a land fraud investigation. And so the two men uh, agree to a duel uh, right outside of Knoxville in East Tennessee. And as they head out to the dueling grounds, one or both of them changes their mind, and they wind up uh, in sort of a a comical uh, type scenario where uh, Sevier is hiding behind a tree, and Jackson is threatening to shoot him, and their their friends come in and, and rescue both of them from what would have been probably a murderous affair being carried out. So that's the half duel. It's, it's a duel that's sort of developing, but doesn't really lead to anything. And then the major duel that Jackson's known for is the duel with Charles Dickinson in 1806. And this duel started when Dickinson actually injected himself um, into uh, a debate that Jackson was having 
with another man about a horse race bet. And Dickinson uh, may have said some things about Rachel Jackson, uh, some disparaging things about her. Uh, he certainly insulted Jackson. And so the two men agreed to, to fight a duel. They left Nashville, went across the state line into Kentucky because dueling was actually illegal in Tennessee at that point. And they shoot at one another. Dickinson shoots first, hits Jackson near his heart. Jackson stands there, fires back, Dickinson in the stomach, and bleeds out. And so when you look at the total of Jackson's duels, again, there aren't as many as people think, but he does kill a man in a duel. And there are a number of other instances when he doesn't duel someone, but he gets into fights, he gets into brawls, you know, he canes a man. So there are a number of other episodes that happen in his life that speak to his violent character. So even though he wasn't this masterful duelist who fights hundreds or dozens of duels, he certainly is someone who early in his life in particular, has a, a very violent nature. And it's reflective of Southern society, uh, and it's reflective of where he was living, because it was a very hard scrabble life. And not only did you have to prove your reputation, but you also had to protect yourself uh, in order to survive. You've touched upon the fact that there's a lot of myth surrounding the man of Andrew Jackson. So fact or myth, did Jackson actually live with bullets embedded in his body from these duels? He, he lived with a bullet... Um, that was embedded in his heart from the Dickens or near his heart uh, in the Dickinson duel. Uh, he actually lives with that one um, for the rest of his life. Uh, it's so close to his heart that doctors don't think that they can extract it without killing him. Um, there's another bullet that he carries with him for a few years that results from an 1813 street brawl that he has with two brothers, uh, Jesse Benton and a man who becomes a Missouri senator, Thomas Hart Benton. Um, Jackson questioned something about Thomas Hart Benton's um, character, and so the, the Benton brothers decide that they're going to do something about it. Jackson and some of his friends go to downtown Nashville. They're walking around. Brothers see them, and they, they start a brawl. They're on the streets of downtown Nashville. It spills over into a bar, and Jackson gets shot uh, during that particular encounter as well. Um, that bullet will stay in him until uh, the 1820s. And when it actually is extracted by a doctor, Jackson supposedly gives it to Benton as a souvenir of their former enmity, because by that point they had become allies. So yes, he does. That is a fact. He does have bullets in him that he carries with him and at least one of those with him until he dies. That seems like a really painful fact, but it does show that he's he's tough. Yeah. And, and one of the things about Jackson that a lot of people don't understand is that he has a lot of health problems. Um, during the War of 1812, he suffers from dysentery. Uh, he has bullets in him. Um, he has all kinds of health problems. And when he becomes president, he actually has to sleep reclining up um, in order to ease the pain. So if you think about how much pain he's in um, and his his sort of temperament, his natural temperament, it's no wonder he was uh, always kind of temperamental with people and sort of short and angry at times. Uh, it makes sense. Yeah. Let's talk about Andrew Jackson as president. He first runs for presidency in 1824. And one of the f interesting facts I found in your book was that in order to run for president at that point, the Tennessee General Assembly nominated him as a candidate. I mean, didn't early Americans have political parties and party nominating conventions back then? They didn't have uh, presidential nominating conventions. Uh, the first presidential nominating convention uh, occurs in 1831 with the anti-Masonic party. They sort of have political parties, and it, it, it depends on which historian you ask. There are some historians who argue that political parties really don't develop in their fullest form until the Jacksonian period, until 1828 or even later. You have some historians who would say that you have these proto-political parties or pre-political parties that grow up from the very beginning in the 1790s. I tend to to take a middle ground. I think you can certainly see those early political factions, the Jeffersonians and the Federalists, they have characteristics of political parties as we think of them today, but you don't see the, the full-blown political parties that we would, would completely recognize today until the Jacksonian period. But yeah, Jackson, uh, his nomination is, is not something that I think he wanted. Um, there's a faction, there are two factions in Tennessee who are fighting with one another, 
and one of those factions wanted Jackson to run for the Senate, U.S. Senate seat, and then that leads to his nomination for the presidency. And Jackson, despite what uh, people think, Jackson, I think, was reluctant to run for the presidency in 1824. Uh, In his letters, he talks often about um, he's doing this only because the people want him to. He just wants to retire to his farm at the Hermitage and spend time with Rachel and you know supervise the livestock and the crops and all that. And I think it's I think it's a genuine expression of what he wanted. Um, by that point, uh, he's uh, let's see by sixty seven he's in nearing fifty sixty. Uh, so he's someone who wants to uh, retire and you know given his health and his age, you can understand why. The election of 1824 didn't seem like it was for the faint of heart either. So it makes it an interesting story that Jackson ran because there were actually a lot of candidates in that field. Would you tell us about the presidential election of 1824? Sure. Uh, It's really an interesting election uh, that hasn't, I don't think, been given enough attention. You have uh, four major candidates. There are some other candidates who think about running or who start to run and then drop out. So Jackson is obviously one of the candidates. You have uh, John Quincy Adams, the son of former President John Adams, who also runs. He's from Massachusetts. You have William H. Crawford, uh, who was from Georgia and uh, was uh, at that point the Secretary of the Treasury. And then you have Henry Clay, uh, Speaker of the House. So you have these four candidates who had emerged, and they really had emerged because the Federalist Party or faction, however you want to define them, had disappeared at the national level. So there's really only one political party or faction left, and that's the former Jeffersonian Republicans. And so you have that, the Jeffersonian Republicans sort of splinter based on personality. And what happens as a result of the election is Jackson wins the most electoral votes but he doesn't get a majority. And so what the Constitution stipulated was that in cases like that, the top three vote getters would have their names submitted to the House and the House would vote by state for the presidency. And interestingly enough, the man who seems to have made the difference in the election in the House is Henry Clay, who is the Speaker of the House. He's in fourth place, so his name is not part of the of, of the top three, of course. But he appears to have used his influence to ensure that John Quincy Adams won the election in the House over Jackson. And in fact, um, there's a, a meeting that Adams and Clay have. And after that meeting, there, there are rumors that circulate that the two men have agreed to a bargain with one another in which... Clay would help Adams win the presidency, and in return, Adams would appoint Clay to the Secretary of State position. And once the House election is over and Adams is uh, selected as president, a few days later, he does appoint Henry Clay as Secretary of State. And that is really what galvanizes Jackson and his supporters for the 1828 election. Um, Jackson, after the, the, what he calls the corrupt bargain between Adams and Clay, After that takes place, after he loses the presidency, he gets a fire in his belly to become president that had not been present before. And from February of 1825 until he's elected in November of 1828, Jackson is determined that he's going to win the presidency, not only for himself, for the people, because he believes that the people have been swindled out of their true choice in 1824. And the people seem genuinely enamored with Jackson because when he wins the presidential election of 1828, thousands show up to see him inaugurated. So I've often heard this story. So this is another fact or myth question that so many ordinary Americans attended Jackson's inauguration that they showed up to the White House to party with him and that the servants actually had to put the alcohol being served out on the White House front lawn to protect the White House and its furniture. So is is that story true? And did that many people show up for his inauguration? So the story, like a lot of stories, is part fact and part fiction. Um, There are a lot of people who um, obviously uh, see Jackson's inauguration in March of 1829 there are around 20,000 people who, who gather around the Capitol um, to watch him be sworn in. And then you have a number of those people who wind up going to the White House for a reception. And there are so many people there 
that Jackson's advisors and friends actually have to pull him out of a window to help him escape the crowd because they were so great that they were about to crush him. And there is an observer who writes about there were so many people there that they had to be lured outside with liquid refreshments. What is sort of fiction about this is the idea that there are people from Tennessee, ordinary people from Tennessee or from Georgia or from the Carolinas who make their way to Washington just to see their man inaugurated. Historians have looked at this story. They've looked at, you know, who actually would have been able to make the trip and what would have been their motivation. And what they have concluded is that, yes, you certainly will have some people who may be from surrounding areas in Virginia and Maryland who would come to see a president inaugurated. But many of the people who come to Washington um, for Jackson's inauguration are actually looking for jobs. They're looking for Jackson to appoint them to some kind of government position because they believe that he is someone who's going to bring about a change in government and they want to be there when he makes that change, when he replaces people, um, people who are perhaps more like him. So, uh, again, it, it, is there a throng who's there? Yes, absolutely. Are these average Americans who are traveling hundreds or thousands of miles? Uh, not for the most part. These are, these are job seekers who are looking for something to get from Jackson. It does seem like a, a long way to go for, for a party. Yes, absolutely. President Andrew Jackson really has three issues that he deals with during his two terms in office that are quite controversial. So I wonder in our time left if we could just touch upon those issues. So let's start with the nullification crisis. Could you tell us what the nullification crisis was and how Jackson dealt with it? The nullification crisis arose from a group of South Carolinians who were upset about a a federal tariff that had been passed in 1828. And they they call this tariff the tariff of abominations because it raises tariff rates on some items, raises tariff rates to 50 percent, not on all items. So they're upset about the tariff. They believe it unfairly taxes Southerners because um, Southerners were importing more things, more goods than Northerners. But there's a, a, a subtle part to this. Not only are they upset about the the economics of it, but they're also upset about the power of the federal government. The federal government has the ability to raise this kind of revenue. What are they going to do with the revenue? Well, today, we're used to the government being deeply in debt and overtaxing us. So that's not something that we really blink twice about most of the time. But at that point, you have these South Carolinians asking, what's the government going to do with all this extra money? And one of the fears was that the government would use that money to help fund colonization efforts or efforts to help free blacks, former slaves, um, make their way back to, to Africa or make their way to Africa uh, if they had never been there. So the, the subtle issue is this idea about federal power and about how that federal power will influence slavery. In 1832, Congress passes another tariff. And this is what really sets off the nullifiers. They meet together in the fall of 1832. They pass in South Carolina an ordinance of nullification to nullify or to void the tariff of 1828 and the tariff of 1832. Now, at that point, Jackson has has an issue. And it's kind of an interesting one because he's a Southerner. He's a slave owner. He understands the perspective of the nullifiers. But he's also someone who had served in the military. He was someone who had been very much a nationalist in the sense of helping keep the Union together, helping it expand. And so he faces a real question. And what Jackson does is he issues a special message to the nullifiers that tells them that continue down this path, they try to nullify federal law, then he will consider it treason. And he actually makes military preparations to go to South Carolina and to enforce that federal tariff if it becomes necessary. Now, over the winter of 32-33, what happens is you have a group of congressmen, and Jackson is involved in this to some extent, who meet together and who work out a compromise that lowers the tariff and that sort of releases the pressure they have been building. But this is probably the closest the United States comes to civil war um, prior to the actual civil war that begins in 1861. And this is one of the things that Jackson should be given a lot of credit for that he takes a stand against nullification, he takes a stand for the Union, and he was willing to go to war with people who were more similar to him than not, 
over this issue of keeping the country together. And it's not often remembered today because of all the negative things about Jackson, but this is one of the high points of his presidency and of his life. Let's talk Indian removal. John would like to know more about Jackson's Indian removal plan and what drove him to pursue it. Was Jackson just a crafty politician grabbing land for himself and his supporters? Was he just racist? Was he both? Oh, such a big question. Um, This is probably what most people know about Jackson nowadays, is that uh, he removed the Indians. Um, So let me... Let me try to address this in a number of different ways. Um, The first thing we have to understand is that we are looking at this from a 21st century perspective. And what we think of as offensive, what we think of as, um, you know, inconceivable is not something that Jackson or, frankly, a majority of white Americans at that time uh, would have thought in the same way. Now, that doesn't excuse what happens to Native Americans, and I want to be clear about that. But I think we have to to put ourselves in in the time period and understand why Jackson makes the decisions that he makes. And then we can judge, based on our perspective today, whether that was good or bad. So Jackson decides that he wants to make Indian removal one of his top priorities for a number of reasons. One of those reasons is because from the time he was born until he becomes president, Jackson had struggled with other white Southerners against Native Americans for territory. Um, The Waxhaw area that he grew up in had been racked by conflict before he was born. Um, When he moves to Tennessee, uh, he participates, along with other uh, Nashvillians, in fighting Native Americans in 12. That is who he spends most of his time fighting. It's not the British, actually. It's Native Americans. So Jackson had been born and bred to believe that Native Americans were encroaching upon white territory, that they were an obstacle that had to be removed. And his experience during and after the War of 1812 not only solidifies that idea, but it makes him believe that unless Native Americans are moved out of the way, the United States will never be successful. There will always be a a, a national security threat from the borders. So he determines to remove Native Americans during and after the War of 1812. And then, of course, when he becomes president, that is one of his major agenda policy items from the very beginning. Jackson also, to go to your listener's question, Jackson also does look to benefit from this personally uh, for himself and for his friends. So uh, following the War of 1812, Jackson and several of his friends and relatives are involved in land speculation in Alabama, which is where the Creek Indians had largely settled. And he um, and his friends and relatives take advantage of the fact that those Native Americans had been pushed off the land by Jackson's men and that that land was now available for a very cheap price. And he actually writes uh, relatives and friends and friends of friends and tells them, come to Huntsville, Alabama, come to Pensacola. You can get land very cheaply. You can make some money to do that. And he does that. So. Jackson is motivated by what we today would call racism. Uh, He's motivated by greed, but he's also motivated by by what he saw as national security. And you also have to remember that presidents from Washington forward had done, not to the same extent, but they had done what Jackson wanted to do. They had removed Native Americans. What Jackson does, though, is he's very effective at it. And he makes no bones about it. He He doesn't try to make it look like something it's not, really. And uh, he's successful at it. And it's something that, as I said earlier, this is the thing that most people today recognize about him, remember about him, and criticize him for. And certainly, I've had uh, conversations and emails and encounters with Native Americans who have something to say about Jackson, think about him. And it's understandable why they think that. Last major issue. Andrew Jackson killed the Second Bank of the United States. So why did he do that? What does the bank do and why does Jackson dislike it so much? Part of Jackson's dislike for the bank, the National Bank, is the fact that he had had some negative encounters with banks early in his life. Um, There's one episode in the late 1790s when he's very close to going to debtor's prison uh, because he had um, served as security for a, a friend and that friend had not been able to pay. So Jackson became responsible for the debt, and the bank demanded payment, and Jackson had to scramble to to help pay that off. So part of it is his personal experience. Part of it is his belief that 
the National Bank had interfered in the presidential election of 1828. So the National Bank, um, to put it in simple terms, was a part private, um, part government entity. So it has private funds in it, but it also has the government's deposits. So when Jackson receives word after the election of 1828 that the National Bank had attempted to influence the election against him and in favor of John Quincy Adams, his opponent, Jackson becomes furious. And that is really what sets him on the path to trying to destroy the National Bank. Now, how much validity there was to those accusations about the bank um, is unclear. There's an, there are several investigations, actually, that don't really turn up a lot of evidence that the bank was using its money. There are some directors and other officials who were campaigning for Adams. But Jackson believes that the bank was, uh, was using its money against him. And so he, when he identified an enemy, that enemy oftentimes became a mortal enemy. It was very hard to be his enemy and then become his friend. Um, once you were on his, on his bad list, you tended to stay there. And in the case of the bank um, and its president, Nicholas Biddle, um, they stay on his list. And he does everything within his power, particularly during his second term, to ensure that bank no longer has influence over politics and that the bank is destroyed, and he's successful. Um, the bank's charter or contract runs out in 1836, largely due to Jackson, and he is very happy to see it go and see it uh, sort of fade away into the distance. Let's transition to the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. One of the stories that always sticks with me about Andrew Jackson is on April 13, 1830, he and Henry Clay sit down to dinner to celebrate Thomas Jefferson's birthday, and they exchange toasts. Calhoun stands up and uses his toast as an opportunity to extol the rights of the states over those of the nation. Andrew Jackson counters Calhoun's toast with one of his own. Our union, it must be preserved. So, Mark, in your opinion, what might have happened if Andrew Jackson had sided with John C. Calhoun in regards to states' rights before national rights? Would the United States have careened toward civil war faster than in 1860? That's a very interesting question. And my students love what if questions. You know, what if this happened? What if that happened? So uh, I like your question. I wonder, there are two possible scenarios that come to mind. I wonder, first of all, if Jackson and Calhoun allying with one another, if that would have actually helped to stave off the Civil War. And I don't think that that necessarily would have been good for the nation. So let me explain why. Let's say that Jackson and Calhoun team up together in the 1830s. They decide to support states' rights, and that allows, say, John C. Calhoun, who was Jackson's vice president during his first term, that allows him to then become president after Jackson serves two terms. What would the country have looked like with someone like Calhoun at its helm for four years or for eight years? I think it would have looked very different. I think it probably would have helped solidify Southern power and would have... Um, solidified that, that grip that Southern slave owners already had on the federal government. So if you look at it from that perspective, that may not have been such a good scenario as it played out. And then if you think about another possible scenario, what if Jackson and Calhoun ally with one another and that allows the Southern slave owners to continue to control the federal government? What if Northern states seceded? And if you know your early American history, you know that in 1804, there had actually been a secession movement in New England. Um, and in 1814-15, there had been another secession movement in New England. So I wonder if, if Jackson and Calhoun had been able to, to find common ground and to agree that states' rights was more important, I almost wonder if it would have been the northern states that would have seceded instead of the southern states. And how would that scenario have played itself out? Would Southerners have been happy to see them go? Would they have tried to fight? Uh, as Lincoln did to keep them into the Union? It's a very interesting question. And, um, you know, it'd be a great story or book for someone to write at some point. 
Before we wrap up here, would you tell us about what aspect of history you are researching and writing about now? Absolutely. I am currently trying to finish a book on the presidential election of 1840, and I'm using that presidential election as a hook into Jacksonian political culture. So I'm looking at um, things like the, the, the elections themselves, of course, but I'm also looking at things like barbecues and parades and music and campaign biographies and, uh, you know, political rallies, all those things to try to get a sense of what were Americans doing to participate in political elections, specifically presidential elections, and how was that changing from, say, 1800 to 1840? Because 1840 is sort of a a uh, high water mark for for 19th century political culture. And then the other thing, the other major thing I'm working on is James Bradley, a friend of mine uh, in New York City. He and I are working on a new documentary edition called The Papers of Martin Van Buren. And this is something that no one has tackled before and I'm not sure uh, that we know what we what we've done to ourselves given Van Buren's poor handwriting. But basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to transcribe and have published in both print and digital form Martin Van Buren's most important speeches and papers. And hopefully what we can do over the course of the next two or three decades is put in digital form all of Van Buren's papers so that they're accessible to the American public and, of course, to historians. Fascinating. I love the log cabin and hard cider campaign of 1840. And one of the interesting aspects of me for it was when I researched the history of the Bunker Hill Monument, I found that the Whigs actually held a a mini political campaign up there, like a little mini convention. It was a big it was a big rally. You have Webster who shows up and it's I forget how many people are there, several, several dozen thousand or something. But, yeah, it's a big political rally in 1840. Where's the best place to look for more information about you, your work, and how to get in contact with you? Well, I have a website, jacksonianamerica.com. That's the best place um, to find contact information and information about my books. I blog periodically there as well. And I'm also on Twitter, at Mark Cheatham. I'm fairly active there. And both of those ways are good ways to get in contact with me. And I'll save you from having to remember those links because I'll include links in the show notes page for this episode. Mark, we've covered a lot of ground today, and it's impressive because Andrew Jackson is a very complicated figure, and we could have spent days talking about him. We absolutely could have. Thank you so much for joining us and for opening our eyes to the man that Andrew Jackson was, and and that was a man who was a Southerner. Thanks for having me. Andrew Jackson held views about African and Native Americans that in our own time are controversial and unpopular. However, as Mark revealed, we cannot hope to understand Andrew Jackson and why he held the views and ideas he did if we separate him from the time in which he lived, which in Jackson's case was the late 18th and early to mid 19th centuries. In fact, it's not just Andrew Jackson. All people are the product of the times in which they live, including us. Someday, 50 to 100 years from now, someone might try to explore our lives, how we live them, our ideas and actions. In all likelihood, the people of the future won't be able to understand the choices we made or the ideas we held if they don't explore our lives within the context in which we lived them. Therefore, if we want to understand the people from the past, like Andrew Jackson, we must explore their lives within the context of the times in which they lived not our present time. You can find more information about Mark, his book, Andrew Jackson Southerner, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode. You'll find it all at benfranklinsworld.com slash zero three four. Would you be my Paul Revere? As you know, Paul Revere helped spread the word of the British advance on Lexington and Concord in April 1775. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow immortalized his deed in his famous poem, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. Now, I'm no poet, but I would be grateful if you would consider emulating Revere's actions by telling everyone you know about Ben Franklin's world. In fact, you should even tell those people you don't know about the show so we can help spread the word about Ben Franklin's world as far and wide as possible. After all, Word-of-mouth recommendations are the best way for new history lovers to discover our podcast. Finally, 
Does viewing Andrew Jackson as an early to mid 19th century Southerner help you understand him better? Email me your answers, liz at benfranklinsworld.com or tweet me at Liz Kovar. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.